Are you taking the right B vitamin? That is the question we are going to answer tonight. We're gonna to be talking all about B vitamins and what they do and how to supplement with them and different things that you should think about when you're getting your B vitamins tested. Because if we're gonna supplement with something, we're definitely gonna to wanna to test. So I am hoping you're ready for the ride tonight. Uh, I'm going to have my notes with me here to keep us on track so we get through this. So if I'm looking over here, that's what I'm doing. Thank you everyone for, the, for joining. Uh, so we're gonna talk tonight about what B vitamins do, how to test them, and how to supplement. Because I see a lot of people do this wrong and I do this a lot in my practice with patients. And it takes a little bit of finesse to get everything right because one size does not fit all, especially when it comes to supplements and especially when it comes to B vitamins. And the cool thing is, is about with B vitamins is pretty much everybody needs B vitamins. B vitamins are what we call water soluble vitamins. So when you, hi, when you, uh, when you're eating your food and when you're taking supplements, your body uses that vitamin that day and then it gets rid of it. Your body doesn't store it like it will a fat soluble vitamin. So B vitamins are a group of vitamins that we need to take consistently every day, whether it's in a supplement or in our food to actually get enough. So it's really important that we are getting in a steady stream of vitamins and one reason in my practice that I tend to harp on B vitamins so much is because I see a lot of women very deficient in these vitamins. And we'll talk a little bit about what deficiency means uh, because there's a couple of different kinds. But the reason why people tend to be deficient in B vitamins is because we burn through them so fast. We use B vitamins in thousands of biochemical reactions in the body and they help those biochemical reactions move along. So if we don't have certain B vitamins, then a lot of those, um, a lot of those uh, chemical reactions can get stuck. And when things get stuck biochemically on the cellular level, then you tend to feel the effects with different symptoms. So uh, I recommend B vitamins because they're going to hit a lot of bases and they're going to keep all of those reactions moving forward, which is really, really important. We don't want you to get stuck. Uh, B vitamins tend to help us with pretty much everything. They help us with energy, focus. They help us make healthy red blood cells. They help us with uh, hormonal support, estrogen detox, hair growth, uh, everything nervous system, your adrenal glands, mitochondrial function, how you're clearing out your hormones, your mood. This is a huge one. Um, and especially things like histamine, which uh, doesn't get enough uh, credit these days, uh, histamine. So uh, you guys can see that is a lot of different organ systems and body systems that, hi, that uh, you know B vitamins are supporting. So if we're not getting in enough, we're going to feel those effects. And one thing that I'm gonna do after this video is post on my Instagram, uh, a, a post that shows you exactly what you should think about for each B vitamin. So stay tuned for that. Uh, but going back to what I was saying about deficiency. So it's really important to make a distinction between what we mean when we say deficiency, because I know that a lot of doctors and healthcare practitioners tend to throw that term around. And when I say deficiency, I generally mean what's called a functional deficiency. So this means that your cells are not getting enough of that nutrient. It doesn't mean that in your body there is, you know, lab low levels of those nutrients. When we're talking about a true medical deficiency of B vitamins, those are diseases that typically uh, people in the developed world do not acquire at all. And the reason why is because um, they have fortified foods with B vitamins. If you look at the back of um, you know, any sort of bread product, it's gonna have enriched vitamins in there. Um, lots of different grains have this as well. Um, even things like milk are fortified with different nutrients. So because our food system has a lot of different ways of getting this in, uh, I don't tend to see true medical serious deficiency symptoms in my patients. Um, 
but it, it is possible, though it, it really doesn't happen a lot. Um, but what I tend to see more is people are actually functionally deficient. So they're, they're maybe getting in the vitamin, but their body's not using it, it's not absorbing it, something's going wrong with the whole process. Um, if we're talking about true deficiencies, probably the most common one I would see is B12. Um, and I think that has to do with the fact that we tend to not have very good stomach acid production in this country. And so you need stomach acid to uh, activate that intrinsic factor in order to absorb B12 in the terminal ileum, which is a part of your small intestine. So uh, B12 deficiency is something I more commonly see than any of the other different types of deficiencies, whether it's a B3 deficiency or a B1 deficiency. So when I'm talking about the B vitamins, we have a bunch of them. We have B1, which is thiamine. We have B2, which is riboflavin. We have B3, which is niacin. We have, uh, there's no B4. We have B5, which is panathenic acid. We have B6, which is pyridoxin. We have B7, which is biotin. There's no B8. So a couple people call certain things B8. Uh, then we have uh, B9, which is folate. And then we have B12, which is cobalamin. So you can have issues with all of the B vitamins or uh, just one or a couple, kind of depends. So how do we figure out if you have a functional efficiency in these nutrients? So you guys know me, I'm all about testing. Testing actually tells us which going, what is going on in your system and helps us decide whether we actually need to supplement or not because some people are actually doing pretty good with their diet um, or they're not incredibly stressed or they don't have a very active lifestyle and so they don't necessarily need to uh, take a B vitamin supplement. Uh, and some people will, you know, kind of come on and off depending on what they need. So uh, it's not just a blanket statement. Everybody has to be on a high quality B vitamin, though um, it is very helpful for most people. Um, so how do we figure out what you actually need? Uh, there's two different ways to do this. Uh, first off is a blood test, just a serum blood test, really easy. And then the second one would be a urine test. Um, and often people are doing both. And it kind of depends what type of practitioner you see. If you're seeing a standard medical doctor, they're just gonna be running um, usually just a B12 and a folate uh, in the blood. And that's really common um, because those tests tend to be the most reliable. You can, you can check your B6 level in the blood, you can check your B2 level in the blood and your thiamine level in the blood and things like that, but they're not 100% correlated with actually being repleted with the with the vitamin. So um, sometimes I will test all of those in patients if I'm really, really concerned that they're not getting in enough or if I want to see where they are in the reference range. Um, but often in a standard blood panel, a folate and a B12 are going to be the most common. And uh, folate, we're going to talk about reference ranges a little bit. Folate is measured in nanograms per a milliliter and in general at least the lab that I use and every lab is a little bit different so take all this with a grain of salt but the lab that I use the range needs to be above 4.6 and then the lab will actually stop testing it at greater than 20 so if your level is greater than 20 it's just gonna say greater than 20 and it's not gonna actually quantify it anymore so you want to be somewhere between that 4.6 and 20 Though I tend to like seeing people around that 10 to 20 range. That tells me that they actually have uh, a certain amount of folate floating around in the blood. Uh, B12 is measured in picograms per milliliter. And the range is very broad, much more broad than folate. Uh, B12 is about 230-ish to 1245. And the functional range for B12 is somewhere between 800 to 900, depending on who you talk to. Um, I really wanna see people in that 800 range if I can. Um, and, uh, you know, because of, of such a broad range, someone that's, you know, say a 300 or 200 in a B12 level is gonna feel a lot different than someone that's in that 800 to 900 range or who's even maxing out the range. So I like to see where people are in the range, even though those tests in the serum aren't 100% perfect. Because when we test a blood measure in the, in the blood, 
what we're really seeing is what is floating around in the blood at that moment. But that doesn't actually tell us what the cells themselves are getting. So when we're testing uh, you know, folate and B12 in the blood, I'm also gonna be running some other tests to see if it's actually getting inside the cell. And so that's when, other, uh, that's when we run a couple of other tests to really determine, okay, you, know, you have a certain amount in the blood, but what's actually getting into the, uh, getting into the cell? Uh, so yeah, these tests are not perfect and they can really fluctuate depending on intake and activity levels. So one thing that I commonly see is um, if you are taking a B12 or if a person is taking a B12 and they're taking it, whether it's oral or a patch or sublingual or it's an injection, that will actually make their B12 level uh, falsely elevated. Um, and in when we're measuring a B12 level, most labs have a cutoff range of 2000. So if it says greater than 2000 on the lab, that means that you've kind of hit the max that the lab can measure it. And if you get that lab result on one of your labs, what it really tells us is that you have a lot of B12 floating around in the blood and they've stopped, you know, they can't measure it anymore. Um, but it usually tells me that that person is doing some sort of active supplementing with B12. So if you're someone that is supplementing with B12, whether it's in a multivitamin or a B complex um, or injections, whether it's um, IM or, or IV, um, and you want to get a really accurate B12 level, you should stop taking your B12, uh, you know, several days before you go in for your blood test. And an injection, you need to have at least a week away from the injection. Uh, and often you need a little bit longer. So every so often I will have patients that come to me and say, Dr. Meg, my blood level of B12 is too high and I'm really concerned, or my doctor told me to stop taking my B complex, uh, supplement because I had high B12 uh, on the the blood test and that's just um, you know technically uh, good advice if you're thinking about it very linearly but what that doctor probably doesn't know is that if you're taking any sort of B vitamins in certain people it can make your B vitamin marker go up a lot so uh, you know, if, if that happens, I just recommend that we do do a retest. So we'll stop taking the um, the, the B vitamin and uh, then we'll retest uh, shortly after, um, you know, a week or two and see what the blood levels are. Um, and the reason why I recommend that is because there are certain conditions that will raise your B12 level. And so it can be a red flag. Um, and so it's you know worth looking into, but in general, if you're a healthy person and you're taking active B vitamin supplements, then most likely the B12 is the cause of making your B12 high. So just something to know, especially if your doctor tells you that. Um, definitely ask your functional practitioner, your naturopathic doctor um, about that. And don't just go off of your supplement because your supplement could be really helping you. So uh, these tests are not perfect. We talked about that. Um, let's talk about a couple of other markers that help us determine whether your cells are actually getting in enough B12. So uh, two of those markers are a CBC, which is a complete blood count, and homocysteine. And a homocysteine marker um, is a blood marker that when it's elevated, it means that you are at an increased risk for cardiovascular events um, like a heart attack or a stroke. Um, and when homocysteine is high, it generally means that you are lacking um, one of four B vitamins or more, a combination of, of B2, B6, folate, B9, and B12. So if you have a high homocysteine, you could actually really just be deficient in those vitamins. So proper supplementation with those will bring down levels, which is great. And I like to see homocysteine levels less than seven. When it starts to get 10 and above, that's when I start getting antsy and you know, really thinking about, are you, you know, getting enough of those vitamins? Um, but unfortunately, the standard medical range won't flag things until it's greater than about 15. And so uh, you know, when it gets up to 15, that's you know, way too high in my opinion. And that's when your risk really starts to increase and it really starts to increase after 10 for those cardiovascular issues. So um, once it gets past 10, I usually get people on a high, uh, on a high quality B vitamin supplement because um, that will help to bring down levels. 
um, pretty quickly. So it's, it's a really easy intervention. Um, but high homocysteine is a really big problem when it comes to heart disease and a lot of Americans are walking around having high homocysteine levels that have never been checked by their doctor and they are at risk. And a simple B vitamin supplement that contains the right kind of B vitamins, which I'll talk about in a couple of minutes, that would be just really helpful and life-saving for them. So, you know, it's more than just cute little B vitamins, you guys. It's, you know, it, it's, it's your health on a very deep level. Uh, the other marker that can tell us if your cells are actually getting in enough B vitamins is something called the CBC or complete blood count. In a complete blood count, you have all this information about your red blood cells and your white blood cells, which is great. And one of the things inside of the CBC is called an MCV. An MCV stands for mean corpuscular volume, which is really just a fancy term for the size of a red blood cell. And when we make red blood cells, we need to express DNA for that to happen. And when we're expressing DNA, moving DNA around and using DNA, we need things like Foley and B12 to help with the unfolding and the refolding and the structuring of the whole thing. And so if we don't have enough Foley and B12, what tends to happen to your red blood cells is that they tend to get big because if there's not a uh, enough of those two B vitamins around, then it's kind of like bad construction. You know, the, the cells kind of get bigger because there's not enough of those vitamins to have really good um, DNA use. And so, um, you know, they tend to become larger and the cellular machinery doesn't really have the right tools to create the right size cell. So if your MCV comes up high, on your CBC test, then that can indicate that you're not quite getting enough B vitamins into the cell. And that is specifically for folate and B12. So uh, definitely get your CBC and your homocysteine checked if you haven't recently, because uh, that can help tell us. And I will see I will see MCVs that are really high go down pretty quickly with supplementation when that is the reason behind their high MCV. You can have high MCVs for lots of different reasons that I'm not going to get into here, but often it's just a B vitamin problem. And so we will supplement and that will come down. But of course, you know, talk to your doctor and, uh, you know, make sure that you are good to go before you take these things, um, but that you were also thinking about all of the reasons why that marker could be elevated. Because it's not just B vitamins, but in my experience, it's often B vitamins, especially if you're a generally healthy person. Uh, and then let's talk about genes for a second because a lot of you guys know about MTHFR, which is a gene that helps you make active folate. Uh, and every so often people will have certain gene mutations that affects how you are actually using B vitamins and that affects what you can use in your body. And if you don't have enough B vitamins, you can have all of those symptoms that we talked about earlier. So if you have one of those genetic mutations that affects your B vitamin use in the body, then generally the treatment is to supplement with it. But, um, your MTHFR, which stands for methylene tetrahydrofolate reductase, which is kind of a fun, fun word, um, it's an enzyme that helps you create active folate. And we need active folate for so many different things. So if your MTHFR gene doesn't function properly, you can't make that active folate that you need. Um, and going back to the homocysteine conversation, that active folate, which is 5-methyl tetrahydrofolate, it's used by the body to convert that homocysteine molecule into methionine. So that's one reason why it will build up is because you don't have enough folate to push that reaction through. So that's why it's so important to have enough B vitamins on board because you gotta process homocysteine and you gotta do a bunch of other things. So that's why supplementing with B vitamins can help clear that homocysteine. Um, but even though some people have this MTHFR gene and they can sometimes have issues making that active folate, that doesn't mean that you just go out and start supplementing yourself with a bunch of uh, folate. Um, that's actually the wrong approach. That's what the supplement companies want you to do, but that doesn't actually help you in the long run because some people have a certain degree of mutation and some people have a degree of mutation that's either 
uh, more or less. And depending on your degree of mutation, that will dictate how much B vitamins you tend to need. And so um, it's important to get a genetic test. If you are concerned that you have issues with B vitamins, it's just a simple blood test. It actually works pretty well. Um, in terms of it's just easy to get these days. It didn't used to be when we were first learning about this. Um, MTHFR tests are about 50 bucks from most labs, um, though I don't know about the insurance-based labs, so don't quote me on that. Um, but one thing I'd want you guys to take away is there is a large, especially on the internet, there's a large group of people that go around saying, oh, I have MTHFR, that means I need to supplement with high doses of folate, and that's just not, not right. Not everybody who has MTHFR gene needs large amounts of folate or B12, or even feels good on them. And the reason why is because MTHFR is not the only gene. You have other genes that affect how you use folate and how you use methyl groups um, and how you use different forms of B vitamins. So we just can't think about that one. Um, when we're talking about people that have MTHFR, often the treatment for those people is to use a type of vitamin called a methylated vitamin. A methylated B vitamin is a vitamin that already has a methyl group stuck onto it. And this essentially turns the B vitamin on and makes it really easy to use. And it bypasses the uh, body's need to actually activate the B vitamin for you, which is great because if you are uh, not good at that step genetically, then we can just do that in the lab and give you a pill and bypass that. And that ends up helping out a lot of people. Um, so methylated B vitamins are B vitamins that are activated. There's also different forms of B vitamins that we call phosphorylated that are also active and that are better forms than the traditional forms. And we'll talk about traditional versus active forms um, in a couple of minutes. Because when you read a nutrition, uh, a nutrition bar on, on the back of a, of a bottle, you have to look for the right amount of vitamin, the right form of the vitamin, and make sure that they're all in there because all the B vitamins work together. So when I'm supplementing a person with B vitamins, I don't like to give large doses of a single vitamin, though some practitioners like to do that. I prefer to give people a combo uh, because all of the B vitamins in all the B vitamin chemistry in the body, they often work together. And so if we push one pathway too hard by giving large amounts of one vitamin, um, it can deplete another pathway and gum up another pathway. So if we just give them all together, uh, people tend to do better. Um, one way to think about this is if, if you guys are into herbs um, at all, like I am, uh, when we're talking about different, uh, different parts of the plant versus the whole plant, sometimes it's better to give the whole plant together than just different parts of the plant or different constituents of the plant. And that's one thing that we do in herbal medicine, which is not the purpose of this talk, but it's the same type of concept. So um, that can be helpful for people that have MTHFR. Um, but again, MTHFR is not the only gene that plays a role, there's others. Um, and because I work with a lot of women, I often see uh, uh, issues with a enzyme called COMT. And COMT is a gene that helps to clear out uh, things like your estrogens, but also things like your neurotransmitters. Um, and methylated B vitamins aren't always a healthy choice for people that have issues with their COMT. Uh, because it can overstimulate them. And same with people that uh, have MTHFR. Often those people, uh, you know, once they find out that they have a gene mutation, they'll run out to the store and they'll buy uh, a methylated B vitamin, which is an activated B vitamin, and they'll start taking it. And some people that are sensitive, because everybody has a different level of sensitivity to things that they take internally, some people that are sensitive will tend to feel really keyed up or jittery or even maybe a little bit anxious um, when they take B vitamins. Um, and this can be because they're sensitive to the amount, but it can also be because they're sensitive to the methyl form. And sometimes the methyl form can make people jittery. Sometimes large amounts of folate can make people jittery. So it's really important that we take a holistic approach when we are doing these B vitamins because we just can't give you mega doses of all these things. So 
Um, if you're one of those types of people that tends to feel jittery when you take a methylated B vitamin or just a B vitamin in general, you could have an issue with your COMT enzyme. And so I would definitely have your doctor test your COMT gene. I know that this personally has made a big difference for me um, because I have issues with my COMT. So I play with my B vitamins a lot to get things just right. Um, but not everybody has that mutation. Um, some people do, especially if you're a woman and you tend to be estrogen overloaded, it's a good thing to check out. So because I've run a lot of women's hormone testing on people, I often will check that one out. Um, and I often will run what's called the Dutch test, which is, which is a dried urine, uh, total complete hormone test. And uh, it will tell us a little bit about methylation on that test, which is actually really helpful and is one of the ways that we can look at whether we are actually using and um, and benefiting from B vitamins. So uh, earlier I was saying that there's a couple different ways to test for B vitamin issues if you're having them, and we can do it in the blood with those blood tests that I mentioned, you know, a, a B12, a folate, a homocysteine, a complete blood count, um, but we can also look at it with something like the Dutch test, which is going to check for your COMT function. It's also gonna look at an MMA, which is a methyl malonic acid, which if you have high amounts of methylmalonic acid in your serum or in your urine, then that tells us that you're not getting enough B12 to move that uh, that substrate through that, that molecule, that methylmalonic acid. So we can figure out what you need based on a couple of different testing methods. Um, and I run, I run all different kinds of combinations with patients, depending on what we need. Often we'll start with a blood test and, you know, a basic B vitamin complex and see how they do. And, you know, if, if they are one of those people where they start to take a you know, methylated B complex and they don't feel well, then we do some more investigating and then figure out what's actually going on uh, genetically and biochemically. So that's all I really want to say about the genetics topic before that totally runs away from me because if you guys have been following anything uh, about MTHFR or COMT or B vitamin uh, utilization or epigenetics, you know that uh, the genetic uh, topic is huge. So I don't want to spend too much time on that, but I did want to call your attention to those specific mutations because that does really affect um, what I recommend to people in terms of their B vitamin use. So. Uh, in general, I do recommend methylated B vitamins to everyone because they tend to be the most tolerated overall. Uh, and if I start someone with a methylated B vitamin, I know that there's a pretty good chance that they're going to do well on it and absorb it. Um, but if, uh, you know, if, if we do end up giving that to them and they don't do well, then that also tells me something different and that tells me what I can look into next. So it's good information either way. Either the person does really well on a methylated B vitamin or they don't feel so well and then we do some more investigating and find out why. Also too, um, sometimes when we put a vitamin in the system like methylfolate, Sometimes the body, there's nothing wrong genetically with processing it, but sometimes the body is just not quite healthy and healed enough to tolerate that amount of methylfolate. And so often we have to start uh, very slowly when introducing it uh, before we get up to any sort of high level or any sort of normal supplementation level. Uh, and I've seen people, you know, where we need to heal up the gut, we need to get some healthy diet lifestyle going before we start that intervention, and they do a lot better. So um, there's a couple of you guys on here. If you have any questions, please hit me with them. Um, now I wanna talk about the different forms of the vitamins that you should look for uh, when you are shopping at the store or when someone's recommending some cool supplement that you should take uh, and you know you can look it up online and say oh actually this is not the greatest choice so I'm gonna I'm gonna go through this list so get out a pen and paper and um, if you miss this I will be reposting it in a couple days and this will be on my blog Since living in a dry climate, I tend to get frogs in my throat now. Always have water around. Okay, you guys ready? So uh, we're gonna go through B1 all the way down to B12. So B1 is thiamine, and it's most commonly in the form 
thiamine hydrochloride. Uh, B2 is riboflavin, and um, riboflavin is best in a phosphorylated form called ribofi riboflavin 5-phosphate. Say that five times fast. Riboflavin 5-phosphate. And that tends to be better than just straight up riboflavin. Uh, but a lot of riboflavin, they don't have this form in it. So it's something that you definitely have to look for. But people tend to do way better on this and it's way better absorbed. Um, B3 tends to be niacinamide. Uh, there's no B4, unfortunately. Uh, B5 is usually a pentathenic acid or a pantothenate. Sometimes it's in there as calcium D pantothenate. That's really common. Uh, B6 is pyridoxin, and for that one, it is uh, pyridoxin 5 phosphate. It's phosphorylated, just like the riboflavin is. And uh, that one tends to be the best absorbed, though you can just do pyridoxin, that's okay too. Um, but that one uh, often helps people that are just not good phosphorylators, which is a whole other topic. Uh, but it makes it more active. And generally when we're talking about vitamins, the more active things are in the body, when you take it that your body ha doesn't have to do an extra step for is helpful. So pyridoxin 5-phosphate for B6. And then uh, B7 is biotin, but biotin is just biotin. So you'll see that on the label as just biotin. Uh, and then methylfolate. This is uh, often on the label as folic acid, but for folate, we want to see something on the label called methylfolate, and sometimes it's called um, quatrifolic, or it's a calcium type of salt. Um, it should say methylfolate, but what you don't want is you don't want folic acid. So folic acid is a totally synthetic form of folate. It does not resemble folate at all. And they started using folic acid years ago when they realized that uh, babies that don't get enough uh, folate don't develop their neurological system correctly. Um, and folic acid, uh, you know, for some people will give them enough folate deep down in the biochemistry, but what folic acid tends to do is it blocks your actual absorption of active folate. And so that's a huge problem. Um, so I definitely recommend folate. If you are taking anything that has folic acid in it, get rid of it. And this is even things like breads and other fortified foods, um, just not something that you want, especially if you have the genetic mutation MTHFR, like we were talking about before. Uh, for B12, there's a couple of different forms that you can look for. Um, I'll start with the one that you don't want though. That one is called cyanocobalamin. So B12 is cobalamin. So there will be different forms of cobalamin when you're looking at a B12 label. So uh, cyanocobalamin actually inside the cobalamin molecule has a little um, molecule of cyanide. That's where the cyano part of cyanocobalamin comes from. And um, it's really cheap to make. Uh, it relies on your body converting uh, the different forms of cobalamin. Um, it has to convert it to be useful. And so that ends up, you know, needing your body to detox a little molecule of cyanide, which, you know, you can do at very small doses. But why put more stress on the system if we don't need to with an inferior form of a B12? So the form of B12 that you want to look for is called methylfolate, uh, excuse me, methylcobalamin, oh my goodness, uh, adenosylcobalamin, and hydroxycobalamin. So the three prefixes that you're going to look for is adenosylcobalamin, hydroxycobalamin, or methylcobalamin. So methylcobalamin is one of the probably more common forms out of the all out of all three. Um, hydroxycobalamin and adenosylcobalamin are the most common in terms of how they're converted in the body and used. The methyl group makes the methylcobalamin very different, and it is stimulatory for some people. It is it is a little stimulating. So uh, you know if that's you with methyl vitamins, then you can take other types of vitamins. So hydroxy B12 is really nice. Adenosylcobalamin is actually really cool because um, it's said that it can actually really support your mitochondria um, with how it with how it gets inside the mitochondria. So I do like adenosylcobalamin, but that's the form that is pretty much the hardest to find. 
and we'll talk about where you can find some of these in a second. So we went through B1 to B12, the forms that you want to look for. So if you missed that, rewind a little bit once this gets posted. Um, so if you're sensitive to methylfolate or you're sensitive to methylcobalamin, you can take other forms of the vitamins. So if you're sensitive to the methylcobalamin, you can take adenosyl or hydroxycobalamin. Uh, if you're sensitive to methylfolate, you can actually take something called folinic acid, which is the precursor to that, but doesn't have the methyl group in it, so it's not going to be as stimulatory. So I have patients do a lot better on folinic acid when they can't seem to tolerate any sort of folate. So um, I'm hoping this is making sense to you guys. Give me a heart if it is. Um, the last thing that I want to leave you with is, you know, what are, when we think about these B vitamins, what are some of the main functions? So when I think of B1, which is thiamine, I think of the nerves. It's very, very supportive for um, the peripheral nerves. Um, we often use it in people that have diabetes to help preserve the nerves. Um, it's useful in, in some kidney disorders. Um, B2, riboflavin, this is really good for helping with headaches, um, but it is also really, really important for energy production. Uh, so love riboflavin, um, very important deep in the biochemistry. And it synergizes with B6. So sometimes it's hard to figure out if you're really deficient in B2, if you're really deficient in B6 um, in clinical practice. And so they're often dosed together. Um, niacin is uh, really important for cholesterol metabolism. Uh, panathenic acid is really, really supportive for your adrenal glands, but it's also huge for helping to detox histamine which is um, one thing that doesn't get talked about a lot, but I use it a lot in my histamine sensitive patients. Um, pyridoxin is really awesome for estrogen detox, but it's also really great for pregnancy nausea. So keep that in mind, ladies. Um, biotin, healthy hair. Everybody knows the biotin, um, really great for hair. Uh, folate is really important for your neurological system, for red blood cell production, for uh, remodeling and using healthy DNA. Uh, it, it influences DNA a lot. Uh, and then lastly, B12, cobalamin, really, really important for energy production, um, fatigue, mood is a huge one. Uh, so if you have an issue with mood, definitely get your B12 looked at and maybe get some of those genetic tests to see what's going on. If that is, um, you know, contributed to do by your genetics and not being able to use the B12 properly. So definitely look into that. So I want to sign off with some uh, possible places where you can get these B vitamins. So um, I'll talk about some of my favorite brands, which I'm not uh, affiliated with. Um, when I'm recommending B vitamin uh, use, I'm usually recommending it in a full spectrum B complex that has all of them in it so that uh, all of them are working together to help keep your levels and help support your B vitamin levels. Uh, like I was saying before, I don't like to dose them singly because they can uh, you know, they can overstimulate one pathway and then you end up being deficient in the other. So it's just better to give them all together. So I recommend a high quality B complex. Um, some patients I'll just put on a multivitamin because they need all of those other supports with the B vitamins or they're, or they're low in minerals. So um, you can do it either way, a B complex or a multivitamin. Though if you really need to get your B vitamin levels up quickly, aggressively, um, the Separate B complex is a better choice, but the best choice would be IVs or vitamin injections. Uh, those work really, really well, and I see them be pretty life changing for some people. And some people tend to need it more consistently than others, so it's always a good thing to have in the back of your mind. But some brands that I really like would be uh, Ben Lynch's company, Seeking Health. Uh, what I like about his products is that he has all of the different forms of these B vitamins. So if you find out that you're sensitive to methylfolate, uh, and you need some folinic acid, you can take that. If you notice you do better on adenosyl cobalamin than methyl cobalamin, you can order that. If you want a multi that doesn't have methyls in it, you can do that. Uh, if you 
want a multi that has the proper forms of methyls in it and all of the other B vitamins, you can do that. So that's my go-to uh, company for uh, dosing, getting really, really specific with my B vitamin dosing with patients. Um, I also use uh, orthomoleculars. Uh, I think it's called methyl B complex a lot. Um, I have a lot of patients on that one. Uh, I also use Thorne's Methyl Guard, which is really awesome for high dose methylated B vitamins. Um, there's a couple of over-the-counter products that aren't too bad either that you can get at Sprouts or Whole Foods or something like that. Um, I believe Jaro B Right tends to be a really good form, um, a really good choice because of the forms of the B vitamins that are inside. Um, and uh, what other companies? Orthomolecular is good. There's a bunch of other uh, just professional brand companies, but I tend to stick with um, Orthomolecular and Thorn and Seeking Health. Those tend to be my favorite. Um, but there are lots of companies out there that make high quality products, but the key is, is that you have to look at that ingredient list. You have to compare that list that's on the bottle with the list that you just learned tonight of, you know, what form of the B vitamin do I actually want it in? So really, really important. And um, you know, before you do any sort of supplementation, you should always, of course, act, ask your doctor because I'm not your doctor. I'm just giving you some ideas to think about to educate yourself so that you can bring this up with the practitioner in your life. Uh, and if you are in California and you need a naturopathic doctor, then I'm happy to help you. Please reach out to me. Um, but if there are no questions tonight, uh, thanks everybody for tuning in, then um, I will go. And uh, if you are watching this video later, especially on my YouTube, please send me a comment below, um, help me get to know you. And uh, if you have questions, please let me know. I love answering questions uh, and um, follow up will be later tonight on my Instagram. I'm gonna post some of this up there so that you guys can see it. And this content will also be on my blog, which is drmegand.com. And uh, for those of you just tuning in, my name is Dr. Megan Strodel Braining, and I'm a naturopathic doctor. And so I talk about B vitamins a lot in my, in my practice, and it's really, really important to get the right one. So are you taking the right B vitamin? I don't know. Go back and watch and figure it out. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out. And I hope to see you around the interwebs. Have a good night, you guys.